Hi everyone, um, I'm Stefan Alexander and I'm a professor of physics in the Brown University's physics department. Um, I'm here to talk about my involvement as the science advisor for, the, uh, for Disney's A Wrinkle in Time. Close your eyes. See with mine. You were a top student. But look at you now. You can't keep using your father's disappearance as an excuse to act out. Yeah, it was a lot of fun and challenging, and I learned a lot, actually. i um, actually working on a sci-fi fantasy movie really um, forced me to stretch my imaginations um, and actually inform um, me even on my research. I mean, I actually work on some of the concepts um, that concern this movie, uh, which is um, some of my research involves um, Einstein's theory of general relativity, which I'll say a little bit about today. But anyway, um, the way this all started was I received um, um, a communication Coincidentally, I was actually in LA given a book tour and I received an email while I was in LA um, from the National Academy of Sciences saying that Disney Studios, um, in particular the director Ava DuVernay, who was the director for A Wrinkle in Time, was interested in um, a science advisor um, because she and her creative team um, wanted to you know, you know, stay as true as possible to the physics. So Madeleine Langle wrote A Wrinkle in Time in 1962, and she was a big fan of um, I, I, the work of Albert Einstein, and saw it fit to use um, some of the concepts in general relativity f to allow the, um, the protagonist, uh, Meg, and also her father, who was a physicist, a world-renowned physicist, to test her, to basically travel very far distances by using a feature of Einstein's theory of relativity. My father believes that we can travel the universe instantaneously. So you fall to space. Or like, wrinkle. So what we have here is a tesseract. It's, well, it's really a very, you know, bad drawing of, of mine of, that's supposed to represent a tesseract. A tesseract is just a fancy word for a cube in higher dimensions. So this is supposed to be a projection of a hypercube or a four-dimensional cube. I mean, one way you can think about this is that you have a cube here, and you can think of these lines going outward as, an, as a fourth dimension. And so this will be like a four-dimensional projection onto three dimensions of a four-dimensional cube. The same way your three-dimensional three version of you, a, sh a shadow of you is casted onto a two-dimensional plane by the sun. Um, so anyway, um, this was her use of the word, but actually in the, move, in the book itself, what Langell actually was really trying to depict was not a four-dimensional um, reality, but the ability to travel through the fifth dimension. And I'll say something about that in, in a quick second. Why she was interested in talking about a tesseract or traveling through extra dimensions came from Einstein's idea that actually, first of all, space, three-dimensional space and time can be unified as a four-dimensional object called space-time. So this idea of this hypercube you can think of as, you know, uh, as space-time and this cube actually existing also in time, sweeping out the fourth time-like dimension. I have to actually, you know, reveal the beautiful Einstein field equations, which, um, you know, we know to be the true description of four-dimensional space-time, and that the important idea here is that space, energy, and matter could actually bend or warp the space-time warp fabric. Depending on how the space-time fabric is warped, it is possible to travel very far distances instantaneously. Imagine. 91 billion light years traveled like that. So when I, when I actually interviewed with Ava um, and I was being considered, one of the things that she and the creative team wanted to, to see happen is, that, you know, is the magic and the fantasy in the movie. Um, that, that the character of that would be honored. 
So how do you, how does one sort of stay true to the physics and at the same time make sure that these wonderful fantasy elements are retained? And that was a big part of the, the joy and the challenge actually of um, working with Ava and the creative team and making that happen. And I think at some point I realized um, that the way to make that work actually is to embrace the idea, the notion that actually a lot of the cutting edge theoretical physics that we, we work at here at Brown and elsewhere is um, actually that there's a lot of fantasy in that already. Um, so for example, um, currently there are ideas um, you know, that definitely um, we're searching for these ideas of extra dimensions um, and that was very much in line with Langle's idea that you, know, you could travel through the fifth dimension and in traveling through this fifth dimension you can end up in four dimensions or three dimensions um, instantaneously at distances that were considered to be really far away. Another way that the theory of relativity could accommodate um, very distant travel instantaneously um, and this idea was already exploited in a couple of movies, um, most recently Interstellar, is the idea of a wormhole. According to Einstein's theory of relativity, space, if we can, let's foc imagine that this surface is really, every point on the surface represents a point in three dimensions. I can imagine that, according to Einstein's theory of relativity, nothing stops space from actually warping in such a way. So imagine if I travel really, really, really far, maybe there's a galaxy here, and then billions of, you know, like, um, um, millions of light years away, I might be another galaxy here, and I go really, really far, space curves. According to Einstein's theory of relativity, you can actually have solutions of Einstein's field equations called a wormhole, where I can actually create a distortion of space here, and there could be a tunnel that actually allows me, this tunnel actually is called a wormhole, and there's a special type of energy that could actually create this tunnel. Um, it usually involves a weird form of energy called negative energy or tachyonic matter. Again, this is in the realm of the theory of relativity, a theory that's been confirmed experimentally, but you definitely need a very strange form of matter to open up this wormhole. And the idea is instead of traveling really, really far uh, along this direction, you can go right through the wormhole and in split seconds end up at distances really, really far away. So the idea of the Tesseract really is using this idea of extra dimensions and the malleability of space and time as a way, as a means of doing um, extra galactic travel instantaneously. So the characters in A Wrinkle in Time, um, and mainly um, there is um, Meg Murray, who is um, the protagonist, um, a teenage girl. Um, she is endowed with special powers, um, and these powers are, you know, sort of um, enabled by the, the three misses um, who appear in the movie, who are, are also able to travel and or so-called tesser through the space-time fabric. Um, her father is able to do that by building um, um, a machine in his home lab. So part of my job was to actually design that and work with the creative team to actually design the, the physics behind that. Um, which meant that we couldn't use a wormhole. Because, in, for example, in Interstellar, the wormhole has to be really, really far away from planet Earth because the amount of energy it takes to make a wormhole, in some cases a black hole, has, cannot happen here on Earth, right? Um, you will have to create energy that would actually destroy Earth itself. So that wouldn't work. So a big part of the challenge is to create, um, using some of Einstein's idea, to create a situation in Mr. Murray's lab, Professor Murray's lab, um, such that he will be able to test her out and travel far distances. And then the other challenge is that somehow has to be compatible with the fantasy element of Meg, who is not a physicist, and, and the missus, who are also able to do the, 
tesser without this machine. So I had to somehow, we had to somehow figure out how to marry the fantasy element, um, the magic, with some serious physics. So how did we get it to work on Earth? How did we get a tesseract working on Earth, right? Um, so the, let me just spell the idea out very straightforwardly. Another way um, it's possible to actually create an event in space and time that allows you to travel very far distances is to, is to actually create a disturbance in, a disturbance in space-time that actually travels faster than light. Imagine that the ant here wants to get to her other hand. The quickest option is to walk across the street. But it turns out a straight line is not the shortest distance between two points. Not if you use a fifth dimension. So I, remember, Einstein's theory of special relativity tells you that nothing can travel faster than the speed of light. The real statement of that is actually nothing in the context of space and time Nothing within space and time can travel faster than the speed of light. But actually, nothing restricts space itself from traveling faster than the speed of light. And that's kind of what general relativity is about. General relativity is about how space actually can change, right? How space warps, both in space and in how, how space can actually warp at different points in space, and how it could also warp in time. And so one idea, as you could imagine, is that you create a bubble Okay, and the bubble in space and time, within the bubble, you can imagine, fill in this bubble, okay, inside the bubble, just think about water, creating a, a bubble in water, right? Um, inside, inside the bubble, there's nothing, there's air. Outside the bubble is water, and then there's an interface between the water and the, um, and the air. And what's really going on is that that wall, that interface is a thing that moves, okay? So you have this impression that this bubble, that the air molecules, the air is actually moving. But what's really moving is the interface, all right? The surface of the bubble is actually moving. And, and, and that surface retains itself. So imagine you do a similar thing with space. So this is actually, there's a fancy word for this. It's called a warp drive. It's a region of space that contains the same kind of energy that a wormhole contains. It has negative energy. Oh, by the way, these are solutions in the Einstein field equations. That you can actually have a, configura a bubble configuration that warps space, and that if there's negative energy inside this bubble and regular matter outside the bubble, this region could actually travel faster than the speed of light. And so the idea here is that imagine that in Mr. Murray's lab, he has some very advanced um, piece of technology that allows him to concentrate a region of space in his lab where it's injected with this negative amount of energy and that negative amount of energy encapsulates him and that allows, that creates this bubble in space and time that could travel very far distances. Now there's some problems here, right? And this is where, um, this is sci-fi because even though Einstein, the science, okay, theoretically supports this, um, how you would create such a negative energy configuration in a lab and control it, that's definitely very sci-fi-ish, right? No difference than, than warp drives uh, in Star Trek. So that's the game we're playing. We're using ideas that are theoretically possible, but, you know, imagining that there is some, you know, new technology that Dr. Murray discovered that allows him to encapsulate himself in a bubble and do that, and, and, and do that. So what you'll see in the movie is you'll see um, Mr. Murray has some sort of light ray being concentrated in a liquid. And so the idea I used there was, um, again, using Einstein's idea that energy and matter could warp space. So I can imagine having some special form of energy that creates this bubble and makes the bubble unstable. So we need some kind of instability. What I mean by that, you need the energy to continue growing and growing and growing. If I fall down a hill, for example, that's kind of like an instability, right? Because I start off with you know, zero kinetic energy, and then the energy grows, grows, and grows as I fall down the hill. 
All right, so there's an instability towards getting to the bottom of the hill. So imagine I do a similar thing here. I inject energy, and that energy, it's localized somewhere, and there's an instability. And that kind of physics I use is the idea that light, if I have a huge amount of light, the energy flux in light, I actually might be able to warp space with that. And so the physics there was to use a phenomenon called sonoluminescence. And the instability there is that what sonolumines sonoluminescence is, it, 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 sonoluminescence is a situation where I take sound waves, and that sound wave in certain types, special types of fluids, create bubble instabilities that then turn into light. And that instability, um, some of which is still misunderstood, the physics is not completely understood, the idea is that that, that sound to light phenomenon becomes this instability that encapula encapsulates Mr. Murray and creates a pattern um, that warps the space-time fabric and allows him to travel at these far distances. Part of why this was done was, you know, I, um, I'm guilty of trying to connect sound to physics a lot, to music, to interest in things in physics. Um, I wrote a book called The Jazz of Physics. And I thought, um, and certainly um, the creative team and Ava really liked this idea of using the physics of cymatics, the fact that sound can create patterns. In this case, the sound patterns create light patterns, and these light patterns look very beautiful, and there's something very beautiful about that. And um, so that's kind of where the artistic and the, the sort of fantasy element started to interweave itself with the sci-fi. It, it, it was really, it was a lot of fun and actually quite challenging um, in, um, working with um, Ava and the creative team um, to sort of bring together the fantasy element with the sort of um, physics of relativity. Um, and there were also some hints at using ideas in quantum gravity. So you'll see that we use ideas of quantum entanglement. Um, there are n theories on the market um, that um, physicists are playing with using ideas that um, quantum entanglement is actually related to wormholes. And so you'll see allusions to quantum entanglement. And I'll leave that to you all to to let your imaginations run wild and figure out what that has to do with, you know, with um, the other concepts that we developed in the movie. Thank you very much for your time and I hope you um, enjoy the movie.